I wish I could be a poet. It would have been fun. <laughs> Family of John Jones passed away. Senior year. Senior year. Senior year. Senior year. He's a good man, he's honest. Uh, he follows rules that are really so established that you want. I'm sure he'll follow that. Alright, some praises from Jack Wetzel. Let's spend some time. You get your upper edge on it, yeah. He's a neighbor that he did. Right, that's what he was I wouldn't help you. Yeah. Let me, um, let me think of Okay, if you have a thought. Yeah, I've seen it. We'll do. So I wish I could be that one. That'd be fun. <laughs> Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If the ushers would please come forward.
Today I will read the numbers 21, 4 through 9. They traveled from Mount War along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have but sinned when we spoke against you, the Lord, and against you. Pray that the Lord would take away the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when they were bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. These are the words for the people of God. This is one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. I love when God is that salty. Uh, you're upset with me? Snakes. <laughs> well, the surface, it looks like maybe God's being a little too overboard, right? You know, like that seems like a harsh punishment for wanting something other than bread. If your kid's like, I don't want that, I want chicken nuggets, you know? <laughs> Better than the streets of the Well, I'm assuming you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just a quick and easy death, right? It's not like they just are smitten, right? I mean, it's a slow, painful, and terrorizing death, right? Like the snake, I mean, first off, there's a snake. We don't like that. Then the snakes bite. And it takes time for that venom to take over, right? I don't know what it is about human beings. But we really don't like snakes. Of all the creatures in the garden, <laughs> the snake is our least favorite. Do you remember Adam and Eve in the garden with the snake? Genesis chapter 3. I did that sermon two years ago. Poor snake. <laughs> he was the only one who told the truth and never spoke back to God when addressed by God. The snake was the almost the most faithful creature there, and yet suffered uh, all the common consequences. Adam blames Eve, Eve blames the snake, and the snake keeps his silence before his creator. And yet we still hate those snakes. We still blame them for our problems. And here we are when we read Numbers 12. <coughs> we're reading the snakes. They're evil. They're awful. They're terrible. They slither. Okay, well, snakes would not be so bad after all, but, Pastor, we don't like them. They slither, and they're gross, and they attack us. And that's true, and many of them are venomous. Okay, that's a problem. And they're willing to attack humans, which are we're much bigger than they are, but they're, they're pretty feisty. So when God sends the snakes to the Israelites, they do cause death to many of them. And this, of course, all these snakes creates a hysteria. Everyone's gone crazy, lost their mind. The people beg for the snakes to go away. They're not asking for fear anymore, are they? <laughs> They've forgotten all about their hunger. Just anything to get rid of these, these terrible creatures. So let's do a little exercise. Let's just imagine, right? Okay? Let's, we got to bring the biblical story to our world and our, our life to sort of think about what this must be like. So imagine that I had Thomas Buca lock all three exits and you didn't know it. And then I had my youth let and release venomous snakes all through the sanctuary and you can't get out. And they don't, they don't just crawl up and down the aisles, they go in between and they slither this way, and they like crawl, and they're in the organ, they're everywhere. Snakes, up in the pulpit, up, they don't, they just, they don't know their boundaries, they just go and they, they, what 
would you do if I release snakes? <laughs> Other than you would make sure I'm the first one to be bitten. Right? <laughs> can you imagine that? And I can see it now. I can see, you know, I can see Mason jumping up in the pew and screaming. And I can see Mike Marconer trying to like take him out, but he can't because there's so many of them. And, and I think it's when it's passed out at this point. I'm not sure if she's been, but she's not she's not doing well. Uh, and of course, you know, some of the youth, uh, Juan, Juanito, he's playing with the snakes, trying to like mess her up. You know, everyone's just lost their mind. Of course, you know, in Appalachia, there are churches that still do this, that have venomous snakes in their church service. Did you know that? Did anyone not know that? Because I didn't know that until the seminary. I had no idea that snake handling was a real thing. And they have to be poisonous or it doesn't count. Yeah. You know, we can always start a new trend here about <laughs> <laughs> God provides them enough. 
that they want more, they want variety, and more than anything, do you remember? The Israelites begged for meat. There was a time when they, they desired meat so strongly, God rained down quail, huge amounts of quail. And they ate so much it came out of their nostrils. Now, I've encountered a lot of different kinds of dead birds in my life. Like outside, you might see one on the grass. No. You might see one on the side of the road. I once saw a dead bird in the grill of my wife's car. But there's also other kind of birds. Like I go to Kroger, I see birds that are that are cleaned up and packaged according to body part, right? We just sort them all according to the part. Different organs sometimes bashed together, sometimes whole, right? But prepared. And I eat a lot of chicken. I know mean, this is mostly chicken. <laughs> it really is. Chicken is my favorite food. Always has been. Of course, I love turkey. I love duck. Mm. I love poultry. I have eaten so much poultry. I, I don't even. I don't. I, I haven't even tried to calculate it. It's too much. And all of those dead birds I have encountered. Never has any bit of it ever come out of my nostrils. In order for that to happen, I would have to eat so much that I'm making myself sick. It's the only way for that to come through my nostrils. When we talk about the Israelites' hunger and their craving, this is not like, oh, I really want some cheese sticks. This is like visceral. This is deep. This is a spiritual and bodily craving. It overtakes their minds and hearts, throwing out all common sense out the window. They want meat, and they want whatever it takes to get it. Deserts are not meat-rich environments, are they? That's because plants are the basis of an ecosystem, and plants like water, and deserts don't have a lot of that. So plants don't like deserts. And the few plants that there are, they protect their water, because it is scarce, which is why cactus plants have, you know, thorns, because they don't want you eating them for their water. <laughs> they don't want it to happen. That's why Cacodonia has spots. There aren't a lot of animals in the desert because there aren't a lot of plants to eat. But there are some animals. And there are some plants. There's not many. So when the Israelites are out in the desert and there's they're dying for meat, and when the quail, they're already gone, right? You remember that? They, they wiped out a whole population of quail. What other readily available meat? Is there in that desert? Snake. Some of you may think that eating snake is gross, but I think most of you who have been in the South at least a few years, you know that we eat snake in the South, particularly in rural areas or areas that have a higher, uh, higher rate of poverty. Uh, probably most of our ancestors in the last hundred years have eaten snake, and partly for survival, like during the Great Depression. You know, because snake is free. Nobody wants it. <laughs> it's meat. It's good. You prepare it well. It tastes good like any other animal. It's just a weird taboo. Lobster was seen as disgusting and awful. It took them 60 to 80 years to finally market the uh, the sea cockroach into a delicacy. Now we just can't have, we can't get enough of it. But a hundred years ago, it was it was only for poor, only poor people ate that. That's gross. So, you know, snake cooked properly can be delicious, and even the snake's venom can be used for different applications, not to mention the other inedible portions of the animal. And remember, snakes are not evil. They are not the devil. And in fact, these snakes are not God's punishment to the Israelites. The snakes are God's gracious response to the prayer of the He didn't want to answer that prayer. But he loved his people. And of 
course, the Israelites' plan backfires. They didn't think, when you get in that sort of mindset against God, you're not thinking straight. You? <laughs> Your plan is not as good as God's plan. I'll tell you that. They begin to suffer bravely and they beg for mercy. I'm sure they wanted the snakes to just go away miraculously and everyone just be healed back to the way it was. God hears their prayer for redemption. But God has another plan. He tells us to Moses. Make a poisonous serpent, like uh, make, like from a manufacturer. Set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look upon it and live. So, Moses, either him or he has someone, you know, help him craft a bronze serpent. How long would that take? I don't know. How long would it take for you to make a statue of a serpent? And about technology. I don't know. Couldn't have been like 10 minutes, right? It had to be a while. Yeah. And they sit there and craft a bronze serpent and then they stick it on a pole. That way everyone can see it. This isn't going to be a pole like this tall, right? Because the Israelite camp is large. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of people. <laughs> now, maybe not everyone can see it clearly, but you got to have it. This would be like a pole and you put like a banner on it, right? Like when you're, when you're like marching in order. Because they're in march order. Right? Remember from earlier numbers, they all have certain. So you gotta have a pole that's like one or two stories high. That way most everyone can see it. Right? That's the idea. Now, let's return to our story. Okay? So we've got Ivan over there convulsing. We got Doug over here. He's he's smelling evil things. He's not sure what's going on. Uh, Randy is rolling over laughing and also in pain, but you can't distinguish the two. Um, I am still up here trying to preach and trying to like, no, but listen, and like, I'm hemorrhaging, and um, y'all are throwing snakes at me, and this scene is just chaos, right? And I say, wait, wait, wait. I have the answer, and for a brief moment, you give me attention because, I, because you're desperate. And I said, look, and this is not true, but I painted a picture of one of the snakes on the ceiling. Now look at that picture, and you won't die. Now, Miss Nancy is has come into like she is like like she's 20 years old, right around me, and uh, getting away from the snakes, and she's just she's just all of a sudden very fit, you know agile and everything. And Miss Nancy, if there were dozens of venomous snakes. On slithering all over. What can I do to get you to look at the sea? <coughs> well, there are no snakes. <laughs> but the snake is coming up at you. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> the idea, right, and right, right. The very idea of taking your eyes. God uses 
to teach us in different layers. Like, in this story, we can learn a lot from imagining us being on the ground, like, way back then at the actual event. But then God can use the story and the circumstance to teach a deeper lesson than the most obvious one. Of course, the obvious one is, care, you know, when you're praying, you can pray according to God's will, because if not, it backfires, right? Um, we need to pray when we get our way, disaster looms. But why is God having us look at a bronze serpent? It's no coincidence that snakes were sent to the Israelites. Obviously, they're a protein source. But people don't like snakes. And even today, they still blame the snake for sin. And in fact, most people view snakes as a symbol of sin because of Genesis. When we lead lives full of sin, not just that, but begging God for more sin to satisfy our fleshly desires, we inevitably draw that sin into our lives and it takes over and creates hysteria. The sin in our life damages us with a myriad of complications and side effects. Usually doesn't kill us, but eventually will. We come out poisoned. We allow gossip, slander, gluttony, selfishness, drug abuse, and worship of money, among so many other things, into our lives. And leaving us helplessly being attacked by the principalities of darkness that operate in the world. We come out wounded, bleeding, mentally unstable, and sometimes to an early grave. All the while, we blame the snake for our problems. Poor snake. The very snakes that we desire and ask for become the scapegoats that we name for causing our downfall because at the bottom of it, we don't want to take responsibility for what we have to do. So God instructs us to do something completely counterintuitive to human logic. And he says, look away from the snakes and look upward towards the hill. Focusing upwardly to heaven and then that bronze serpent, that cannot hurt us, right? It's bronze. I mean, it's not going to bite you, right? It's like a memento. It's a reminder. So as we look heavenward, we also see the memento of where we used to be. We are forgiven, but we don't forget what got us into this chaos, right? So we still have a reminder. We still remember what we, where we came from. But the bronze serpent is Simply put, to be saved from our sins, to be saved from the crazy of this world, we have to stop spending time fighting with and blaming the evil of the world and instead focus our attention on God, keeping just a reminder of where we once were so that we don't return to that way of life. Most of the Israelites lived through the terrifying encounter. They were forgiven and saved from their sins. But if they were wise, they kept on to that bronze serpent as a reminder. We have to pull our attention away from the things that get us into the mess and instead redirect our attention to God. And as God forgives us, we need to allow ourselves to forgive ourselves for the past and of course others. All of us have had selfish desires. We have to allow ourselves to be forgiven for those. Maybe you're currently fighting a battle with a lot of snakes. Turn your eyes away from the world and look heavenward instead. Love 
study, listen, pray, and walk with God. Do keep a memento so you don't return there. That way, while you live in forgiveness, you do not forget what got you into that mess so that you never again have to stumble around with dozens of reptiles biting at your ankles, threatening to drain and poison your life. Because God is working really hard to restore that. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll sing our closing hymn. Gracious to you, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.